So hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be an important and fascinating discussion panel. Safeguarding cultural heritage in the face of urban change is fortunate to be part of both the Chicago Cultural Alliance's Journey Chicago Festival and the Open House Chicago Festival of the Chicago Architecture Center. So first things first, in making this event happen, special thanks goes to Peter Vega, Andrew Laith, Abby Foss, and Nathan Elstrand at Chicago Cultural Alliance, and Hallie Rosen of the Chicago Architecture Center. I am Michelle Stefano, a folklorist with the American Folklife Center in the Library of Congress. As established by US Congress in 1976, the AFC seeks to safeguard and promote living cultural heritage, such as music, dance, storytelling, food traditions, and so on, through our extensive archives, uh, one of the largest ethnographic archives in the world with over 6.5 million items, uh, as well as through an array of public programming and educational outreach to speak in broad terms. Living cultural heritage, when viewed through a holistic lens, is about the present, uh, the shared cultural traditions of communities, groups, artists, and culture keepers of today, but with the important recognition of the histories of communities and their traditions as they are passed on to younger generations and change over time, as well as the all important relationships that cultural heritage has to place and space from landscapes and waterways to the built environment. In this light, today's panel focuses on community heritage and place, specifically in the urban context of Chicago, with a sharpened focus on this notion of urban change. In Chicago and cities across the US and elsewhere, top-down gentrification and development can be forces of erasure, potentially disappearing the layered histories of neighborhoods and the cultural histories and heritages of communities who have called them home. And yet, as we also aim to discuss today, such phenomena may not always be so clear cut and could use a little complication and critical engagement where, for instance, gentrification and development may bolster the livelihoods of communities and their heritage related safeguarding efforts. To discuss these issues and to speak of their own institutional aims and efforts, we are joined today by historian Sherry Williams, founder and director of the Bronzeville Historical Society. Ben Lau, the executive director of the Chinese American Museum of Chicago, Sulon Moy, past president of the Chinatown Museum Foundation and chair of its exhibition committee, and last but not least, Dr. Catherine Kalaitis, resident scholar and director of academic collaborations at the National Hellenic Museum. In part, today's discussion is inspired by the Chicago Ethnic Arts Project Collection in the American Folklife Center archives which has spurred the AFC collaborations with the Chicago Cultural Alliance and its member organizations over the past couple of years now. The collection is based on the 1977 Chicago Ethnic Arts Project, when a team of folklorists and documentarians working at and also hired by the American Folklife Center fanned out across Chicago to document cultural traditions in roughly 25 cultural communities, offering multi-layered glimpses into the city's cultural life of the time. The result of their efforts, the Chicago, excuse me, Chicago Ethnic Arts Project Collection has been digitized and made available on the Library of Congress website for engagement worldwide, consisting of well over 300 sound recordings, such as interviews, musical recordings, and over 14,000 photographs, as well as the researchers' field notes and an array of other materials. Photos of community hubs, such as performance halls and clubs, restaurants, shops, and places of worship, and interviews with community leaders provide deep insights into the culture and history of African American, Latinx, and Native American communities, as well as Asian Americans and Greek Amer Americans, among other communities and social groups in Chicago at the time. Of course, Chicago and its many neighborhoods have greatly changed since 1977 though the collection traces some important economic, political, and social changes at the time that still resonate today. It sheds light on the cultural livelihoods of diverse communities and social groups, 
tracing global connections of migration and immigration and cultural expression, community-led efforts in uplifting and amplifying cultural identity and pride, as well as political and sociocultural issues that were important to them. A number of the community museums and cultural centers represented in the archival collection through photos and interviews with their founding directors and staff were relatively new at the time and are still going strong today. For instance, interviews with Greek American community members shed light on the need in 1977 for developing a special museum to support and promote a steady interest in Greek American history, culture, and contributions to the city's growth. So we will now turn, turn it over to our panelists who will each present their communities and institutions followed by a discussion. However, before I do, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank on behalf of us all, Cairo Dye, Manager of Programs and Events at the National Hellenic Museum, who has so generously and expertly produced this discussion event from beginning to end. I should note that the National Hellenic Museum, along with the Chinese American Museum and the Bronzeville Historical Society are co-sponsors of today's Safeguarding Cultural Heritage in the Face of Urban Change event. So without further ado, I welcome Sherry Williams, who will now take us to Bronzeville. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bronzeville. Uh, as you can tell, I'm extremely excited about sharing the heritage and history of our most important community. Bronzeville is a community that is marked from 12th Street on the north and 51st Street on the south state street on the west and cottage grove on the east and these boundaries i'm sharing uh, were a part of how blacks when they migrated to chicago were concentrated in a community that was uh, created through the need for many blacks to leave the south and come to chicago and make it home and my family was one of those families in 1942, my grandmother arrived in Chicago during the World War II efforts. And she actually worked uh, making uh, canteens and, and castings for, uh, for, for equipment for uh, the war effort. In 1942, my grandmother moved to Chicago from Inverness, Mississippi. And she shared with me that she arrived here because of how important it was for her daughters to attend school. She barely had a fourth grade education herself and she so desperately wanted her daughters to be able to attend high school and college. To talk about Bronzeville, I can't help but think about the 500,000 plus African-Americans who reached Chicago and pretty much moved into the Bronzeville community. There were some exceptions, of course, but we call all who arrived in Chicago residents of Bronzeville, irregardless of their address. I am so thrilled today to just be able to share with you that our journey is one that's shared. Communities parallel to Bronzeville include Chinatown, the community that we really, really have a close connection to because we both advocated that the Dan Ryan did not take up spaces in which we live. Unfortunately, much of what you see for the Dan Ryan displaced thousands. In 1954, my family was forced to move from 31st and Wentworth adjacent to Chinese immigrant communities and move to Inglewood community. And so our heritage is so combined when I think about the parallels of our neighborhood to so many other neighborhoods. So I'm excited, excited to see that Sulon Moy will be a part of this conversation as well. I want to welcome you to Bronzeville. Anytime you like, please come and visit us. Currently, we are uh, speaking about the experiences of two women who were residents of Chicago, who were of uh, spokespersons for the Quaker Oats Company. They portrayed Anjamama combined for more than 40 years. And so our organization, the Bronzeville Historical Society is now celebrating their work as philanthropists, as storytellers, 
as people who were really, really intimately involved in the community of Bronzeville through whether it was Olivet Baptist Church or whether it was through creation of music unions in the Chicago area. So again, welcome to Bronzeville. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, I can't wait to ask you questions and dig into the history of the neighborhood and the changes that have it has uh, faced over these decades. Uh, but I will first now turn it over to Ben Lau and Sulon Moy uh, to also talk about Chinatown and the museum and, and safeguarding efforts there. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Lau, uh, the executive director of the Chinese American Museum of Chicago. Kemok, which is the only Chinese American museum in the Midwest. I oversee the operations, fundraising, and programs for the museum. Our museum serves 8,000 visitors annually through a series of public programs, exhibitions, community events, and collaborative programs. Before I joined the museum about two years ago in 2019, I was the uh, program manager of employment and financial empowerment at Chinese American Service League Castle, a nonprofit, community based, and most uh, comprehensive social service agencies in the Midwest, dedicated to serving the needs of people of all ages and backgrounds of the Chinese community in the greater Chicago area. Being a certified housing counselor as well as financial coach, I employed a number of creative and culturally competent approaches to promote and market our programs and services and help CASO uh, become uh, a hot approved housing counseling agency and uh, maintain its status since 2006. I was dedicated to raise the awareness of better manage, uh, money management in the Chinese community and proud to be able to launch the first credit building landing circles in Chicago Chinatown. Before immigrating to this country from Hong Kong with my family in 1999, I was an educator and editor at the International Financial News Department of Tsingtao Daily, as well as a freelance writer or columnist for several newspapers and magazines. I currently serve as the president on the board of directors of Consumer Action, a national entity which advances consumer rights nationwide. I am a member of Chicago Long Kwong uh, Teen Ye, uh, Association, a family association which engages in fraternal activities such as providing a place for meetings, promoting uh, social activities for members, and aiding newly arrived members from mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. I have over 20 years of experience serving and working in the Chinese community. I also live in the immediate vicinity of Chinatown ever since I came to this country and have been witnessing changes in my neighborhood as well as Chinatown. Some of these changes are good, but some are not so good. And some of them may even be considered as bad. Uh, we will talk about this later. Chicago Chinatown is said to be the only Chinatown in the nation that is still growing. Chinatown had uh, forest from a community where a new Chinese immigrant can easily communicate in Chinese. Most businesses, restaurants, and agencies operate bilingually since the majority of residents speak a Chinese dialect. And more than 60% are foreign born. Some community leaders say Chicago Chinatown has avoided gentrification because it is committed to Chinese traditions that many Chinese Americans value a sense of belonging and choose to stay in the neighborhood. Few Chinese move out, and if they do, they sell their homes or the landlords rent their units back to the Chinese. Hi, Sulan. Thank you, Ben, for your introduction. Thank you, Michelle and Sherry. Um, hi, I'm Sulan Moy, the immediate past president of the Chinatown Museum Foundation and chair of the exhibition committee. It's my pleasure to be part of this wonderful discussion panel with my cultural 
keeper um, colleagues in the Chicago Cultural Alliance. So I am so glad to see Sherry uh, um, as well and Katie. The Chinatown Museum Foundation was established in 2002 when a group of six founders wanted to open a Chinese American museum in the Midwest. Our mission is to advance the appreciation of Chinese American culture through exhibition, education, and research, and to preserve the past, present, and future of Chinese Americans, primarily in the American Midwest. The Chinese American Museum of Chicago opened in 2005 as a result of a generous donor who gifted the building to us. We are located in the heart of Chicago's Chinatown. The story of the Chinese coming to the United States began in the 1850s when Chinese began arriving during the gold rush period in the West Coast. When that ended, the Chinese male laborers were recruited to the arduous work to build the transcontinental railroad, connecting the East and West Coast for economic growth and expansion. The Exclusion Act of 1882 was the first federal law targeted against a single ethnic group, the Chinese laborers from immigrating to the United States. Anti-Chinese racism, riots, and violence in the West against the Chinese drove many to the Midwest and East Coast. In the 1870s, the original Chinatown was located on Clark Street between Van Buren and Harrison. In 1912, due to rising rent and construction, which is um, what we call gentrification, many Chinese moved south to the Armour Square neighborhood at Wentworth and Cermak, which is our current Chinatown. The 1882 Exclusion Act was repealed in 1943, allowing 105 Chinese to immigrate into the country. The War Bride Act enabled the Chinese and Chinese American soldiers to bring their fiancés wives to the United States. This impacted the Chinatowns greatly, changing it from a bachelor society to one with normal family life. The Immigration and Naturalization Act of 1965 abolished the quota system and allowed for family reunification and skilled workers to enter. After Nixon re-established relationship with China, more immigrants, including university students, continue to immigrate to the US from China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Chinese American communities and cities and suburbs adapt to the challenges of the diverse culture. Chicago's Chinatown is land and waterlocked by railroads, expressways, and the Chicago River. The Chinese population expands south and southwest to Bridgeport, McKinley Park, Brighton Park, and other surrounding neighborhoods. Chinatown Square, a development in the 1980s and 90s, slightly north of Chinatown, opened in 1993, adding more retail and housing units to Chinatown. Chicago's Chinatown is vibrant and growing whereas some other Chinatowns are declining or gone. We don't want that to happen to our Chinatown and want to ensure its growth and provide a living cultural heritage community for its residents and visitors. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, and so lastly, again, but not least, uh, I turn it over to Dr. Catherine Kalaitis to speak about Greek Town and the efforts of the National Hellenic Museum. Excellent, thank you. First, I wanna thank Michelle for putting this together. And um, of course, my, my constant companion, I talked to her more than members of my family, um, Cairo, for, for doing all the logistical and technical support. What people don't know is she offers the logistical and technical support in my life. 
and um, I'm also very happy to see familiar faces. That's always comforting. And because these are people who are so dedicated to sort of preserving Chicago's heritage. And actually I've been inspired. Um, I've been inspired by Sherry. I was not going to share a family story, but as you were talking, I, I thought I would, because I think my family story here illustrates an important point about Chicago's Greek town. So my, my maternal grandparents spent the Christmas of 1951 in Chicago, which was a place they had never been and a place that they would leave in February and never return to. Um, my grandmother was eight and a half months pregnant with her first child. My Uncle Joe's birthday is January 6th. Um, so you can, you can do the math, as it were. And my grandparents were approaching their one year anniversary. They were, my uncle was actually born on their first anniversary. The reason they were in Chicago is because my grand, because my grandfather had orders to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. And so they left the very tight knit Greek immigrant community in Southern Utah where they had been raised and got on a train and came to Chicago. And the only thing they brought with them other than my grandfather's military orders was an address. And that address was to the Parthenon restaurant. The Parthenon restaurant was a meeting point for Greek and Greek American servicemen traveling in and out of Chicago. And they knew, my grandparents knew, and when they told me this story years and years later, they knew that if they could find the Greek town, if they could get where there were Greeks, they would find welcome at home. And I think when we talk about these ethnic neighborhoods, that's a really important point. When people who feel like outsiders, when people are in a strange place, being able to find that ethnic community is so important. So my grandparents spent the Christmas of 1951 above the Parthenon restaurant and they ate their Christmas dinner at the Parthenon where service members and their family, Greek service members and their family ate for free. So that is my connection to, to Chicago's Greek town. Well, my grandparents couldn't have known because my mother would not even be born for another five years um, was that I would end up working across the street from where the Parthenon restaurant was but I would, and the National Hellenic Museum is in the heart of Chicago's historic Greek town. But the Greek town I would come to, the Greek town where I would find other Greeks when I arrived in Chicago, would be a very different Greek town than the one they found. And that's because about 10 years after my grandparents were in Chicago in the late 50s and early 60s, Chicago's Greek town was essentially destroyed. Chicago's original Greek town was essentially destroyed and displaced by the Eisenhower Expressway and the University of Chicago at Illinois campus. What you see today on Halstead Street is a business venture that Greek Americans came up with in the late 1970s and onward, right? They opened a Greek town to sort of sell you Greece. And if you're very patient, there's going to be a National Hellenic Museum Dialogue podcast about the way that Greeks have been sort of packaging and selling their culture to other people for a very, very, very long time, about 2000 years. And so Chicago's original Greek town is gone. What, what's there today is, is not, it's not Greek town as it were. And even that is starting to disappear. The pandemic has hit Chicago's Greek town hard and there are fewer and fewer Greek restaurants on the quote unquote street. And that really makes the job of the National Hellenic Museum even more important. There's a really real possibility that we could become the last clearly Greek thing anywhere near where Chicago's historic Greek town existed. And so that, and I, so I think the work we're doing in the place we're doing it becomes very important um, in that way. But I do wanna sort of throw out there before I, I turn it over, and I hope this fuels our, our future discussion. We, in our community rightly lament the loss of Chicago's Greek town. And when I think about like, what if Greek town hadn't been there in the way it was there when my grandparents got to Chicago in 1951. Um, but I think there's another element of this. The destruction of Chicago's Greek town had some positive impact for the Greeks in Chicago, in the Chicagoland area. And one of the ways, it, one of the positive impacts it had is that it did force them out of their ethnic neighborhood at a moment conveniently when Greeks, Italians, other Southern and Eastern Europeans were being assimilated into American whiteness. And so Greeks who were certainly 
in the wake of the civil rights movement sort of becoming white in America for a host of reasons. And at that exact moment in Chicago, Greeks are forced out of Greek town and they kind of flee to the suburbs. They join white flight. And that movement helped Greek Americans move not only into the middle class, but become one of the wealthiest ethnic groups in America. And Greek Americans' assimilation into the American mainstream, Greek Americans' economic success, is in some ways attributed to the destruction of Greek towns like in Chicago. So I'm really interested in having these conversations. And once again, I thank everyone and for bearing with me. Um, so I will turn it back over to our fearless moderator, Michelle. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for um, jam-packed ideas there that I hope we can all tease out. Um, I wanna ask um, Catherine, uh, when you were presenting earlier, you mentioned Greeks have been very good at packaging, uh, you know, Greek American culture, Greekness, if you will. Um, and I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the beginnings of Greek town in Chicago and that, that promotion, that assertion of cultural identity. Um, yeah, so I think these, co these conversations are really complicated for Greeks. Um, so when you have Greeks in the diaspora, so I, I would just, in, the mo in modern terms, I would consider that anyone claiming an ethnic Greek identity living in territory that was under the jurisdiction of the Pope in 1056, um, or the lands that are the cultural, you know, become colonized by those country, by those regions. Um, Greeks have had a really interesting relationship with, you know, Western, in, quote, in scare quotes, culture. On one hand, um, Greeks are, you know, revered in Western culture. Greek culture is revered as the founders of Western civilization, right? The glory that was Greece, all of that from the Renaissance on down. On the other hand, um, for most of that history, um, certainly the Renaissance, you know, from the Renaissance onward, Greek people, ethnic Greek people have largely been living under um, foreign occupation um, for, for most of that time. Greece has been poor, um, you know, even, you know, even 10 years ago, the Greek economic crisis sees Greece as the sort of backwater of Europe. And Greeks in America have experienced, I think, that same kind of dichotomy, right? So um, I'm doing some research right now, actually, on Greeks in America before the big 1890, um, beginning of large-scale Greek migration in 1890. Um, one thing I've discovered um, is that the only person of color in the Confederate government had a Greek father and a Creole mother. And when Jefferson Davis was challenged on this, um, by by members of you know by members of his own government who didn't want um, who didn't want a person of color in, in their in their government because it was a white supremacist government. Um, he said he has Greek blood and Greek blood is so west you know so white it will um, it will eradicate any sort of and his words imperfections in his in his blood which is of course the opposite of the sort of one drop rule that has dominated American um, racial discourse. At the same time, um, not the same time, but you know, 30 years later, as large scale Greek migration comes into America, Greeks are largely regarded as sort of non-white, right? In this middle area between black people and white people, this sort of non-white ethnic group. So Greeks, Italians, Jews, Poles, are sort of the Irish are sort of in this this gray area, but the Greeks have this claim to West to the being the you know to soc to talk to Socrates, and so very early on we see Greek Americans distancing themselves from their Byzantine heritage from their sort of Orthodox Christian Ottoman Greek history, and recreating this sort of imagined classical past and positioning themselves as the inheritors. So, you know, if you go to Greek town today, I mean, today in Greek town, there's weird classical temples on Halstead Street, okay? There is, you know, St. Paul converted the Greeks to Christianity, okay? No one's been using a Greek temple for thousands of years. 
that was a conscious effort on the part of Greek Americans. Those, those kind of things were a conscious effort on the part of Greek Americans to remind their neighbors who did not necessarily see them as white that they were the Greeks of Socrates. And so much of what goes on is Greeks sort of repackage their culture for public consumption. And that's been going on, by the way, into antiquity. Greeks have been selling Greekness as a commodity, you know, well into antiquity. As Greeks in America do this, they are very conscious of, of positioning themselves within American whiteness. And we don't talk about it that way in our community, but that is absolutely what's going on. And I will tell one quick story, and if it's too long, you can cut it out. Um, Papu George, the same guy who spent Christmas in Chicago, um, and my all-time favorite human being, um, he when he came to Denver in 1960, his his um, manager at the he was a he was a district manager for Woolworth, and his his VP told him he should join the University Club, which is kind of the fancy country club in Denver. And when he went to join. Um, and this is 1960, they saw his last name. They said, what kind of name is this? He said, Greek. And they said, you can't join. This is a whites only club. Eight years later, he got a phone call from the university club. And they said, you know, is this Mr. Clytus? He said, yes. They said, we've reconsidered. Now I would hope they'd say we've reconsidered and having a whites only club is a very bad idea. So we would like you to join. But they said, we've reconsidered and we've decided Greeks are white people. That I think is the, um, that shows you first what's going on in the 60s. I kind of hit it out with Greek identity. But I think that the Greeks experience with race in America has been very weird and not a little bit about reminding people that we're white, right? For a host of reasons, for a host of obvious reasons. But I think that's super problematic and something that as a community we need to explore more. Thank you, yes. So um, let's let's dig into urban change. Um, you know, the, the negative impacts of what I mentioned earlier, top-down gentrification, development, uh, rapid development as we see in our cities, but also the positives as uh, you know counterpoints and complications that we can add to the to the discussion. Um, so yeah, Ben and Sulon, would you mind uh, beginning and talking about the good and bad that's been happening in terms of uh, development and gentrification in the Chinatown area? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, uh, back in the 1960s, <clears throat> Chinatown's land was reduced due to the construction of the Dan Ryan Expressway, that is uh, the I-90 and I-94, I, uh, I and the Stevenson Expressway I-55. This created a problem of overcrowding and reduced green space and recreation facilities, and also the possibility of further expansion. Actually, that was the second time Chinatown was facing a possible top-down gentrification development you know, that prompted the efforts of Chinese activists who wanted more land from the city of Chicago. So as a result, a large railroad yard, uh, which was at the uh, present location of Chinatown Square, was purchased and converted into commercial and residential complex. Um, as one Chinese proverb uh, says, in every crisis, there's opportunity. So uh, Chinatown has been growing ever since. And I believe, you know, Sulan has something to say about our Chinatown too. Thank you, Ben. Um, just as Shiri and uh, Katie both were talking before about um, the building of highways impacted um, our communities greatly. So we lost land and people were displaced. And, and so we really don't understand, you know, uh, don't realize the uh, in the important um, changes that's made to our neighborhoods, you know, so that was really devastating. Um, also in Chinatown, we have um, changed drastically in the 1970s. And so in, in terms of our own ethnic group, prior to that, the demographic was uh, mostly 
uh, immigrants from the Toisan uh, area, which is a Guangdong or what we used to call Canton area. Uh, so it's been changed to because of um, the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Act um, that allow more immigrants to come from all over China, Taiwan and Hong Kong. So now more Chinese dialects are spoken other than just Toisan. Uh, Toisanese. So also Mandarin, because that's uh, China's official language. Um, you see that in Chinese restaurants also. Many other regional cuisines, such as Sichuan, Hunan, Xi'an, as well as the well-known Cantonese cuisines are served. Chinatown also has other Asian ethnic restaurants, such as Korean, Japanese, Vietnamese, Thai, etc. And many popular restaurants offer karaoke, bar, and boba drinks as well. So this diversity of restaurants has increased and appealed to the younger populations. So um, also in Chinatown, in addition to the development of the Chinatown Square, we also have uh, senior housing, new restaurants, and other businesses. So about four years ago, we were kind of worried when a Starbucks open at the uh, Jaslyn Hotel. Uh, so far, we were very lucky that the only one uh, chain store that has uh, been landed in Chinatown. And this year, the Marriott Hotel opened on South, uh, South Wentworth. And so, you know, so, so far we see that as a plus, uh, allowing more visitors to come um, it, to Chinatown uh, for businesses or family reunions or um, to visit our Chinatown. Thank you. There's no There's neglecting no that urban change in terms of gentrification, top-down gentrification and, and development um, certainly has negative impacts. And I, I'm sitting here in Baltimore uh, and there are major issues in terms of uh, displacement of communities and the erasure of neighborhood histories and cultures. You know, it could be argued that the dehumanization and destruction of communities today, most often marginalized communities, uh, is a continuation of the blatant and systemic racism of the past, segregation of racist housing laws. So Sherry, I'm, I'm wondering if you would like to talk a little bit more about the, the negative side of urban change uh, and, and what has uh, communities in Bronzeville, what they have endured and are fighting against. Well, I can't help but think about uh, the CHA, the Chicago Housing Authority uh, plan for transformation. Uh, this ambitious plan was to demolish existing high rises mostly uh, in order to uh, build new housing. Uh, what was alarming immediately when I found out in 1999 that this was about to occur, I knew that the third ward, which I lived in Bronzeville and still do, at that time had the largest number of vacant lots than any other ward in the city of Chicago. And so I thought, okay, if there's this plan for transformation, for demolishing the high rises due to their condition and overcrowding and whatever, that the money was in place for new housing to be constructed before the demolition of existing housing. Well, that didn't take place at all. Uh, what we saw was the systematic way in which those who uh, were powerless or didn't have a voice or either in some capacity uh, could not build coalitions quickly enough to put a hold on uh, the demolition of large number of housing. Uh, when we started the Bronzeville Historical Society, we actually were located in Robert Taylor Public Housing. And as each building was demolished within 51st Street to 54th and State Street, we would just move from one building to another to another. And every day that I would come to Robert Taylor Housing to uh, complete a project in which I was really trying to engage residents of the entire community to start documenting their family's histories, to start preserving their photographs and documents and things that they might have brought from the migration or things that were given to them as a part of their family's history. 
So in the entire time I was there, I cried every single day and seeing that upwards of 80% of those who were living in public housing were women with young children. And so I knew that myself already struggling even with a decent job to afford uh, feeding my family and keeping the bills paid. I could only imagine the hardship that many of these women or families period were going to face when they were not going to be moving into housing that would give them either access to their section eight or whether or not the rent would be reduced that they would be able to afford it. And so many of those who were in public housing ended up moving in with families that were already struggling or they moved in with extended family members and friends. Um, They lost completely their attachment to the resources and the uh, community support that they might have been getting when they lived in the high rises. So there was an unspoken system about I have a doctor's appointment, so can my children come to your house after school? The networks of care that many of the families had and had reliance on for babysitting or for homework assistance or for uh, cooking and preparing meals and sharing meals because the community was family. And so your neighbors down the hall were uh, intimately involved in your being able to manage the care of your household if you were especially a young woman with young children. All of that was destroyed as a result of the dismantling of public housing. And so I witnessed that firsthand and the agony of it still sits with me today because every time I drive down State Street and I see that so few of the vacant lots that we see along the Stateway Corridor have housing built, and the destruction and demolition of public housing uh, happened more than 20 years ago. And so that's the one thing that I would say uh, resonates with me when we talk about gentrification or how laws or how mandates or even how folks are demonized to believe that so that the community buys in that this is uh, what needs to happen. Uh, All of it is still evident in uh, the Bronzeville community, the loss of so many people, upwards of 60,000 children. So that is the one thing that uh, really disturbs me today. Yeah, uh, and I commend you on the documentation efforts, right, to attempts to preserve and safeguard those stories and memories and experiences uh, and all the work that you do at the society today. Um, Catherine, I'm gonna turn it over to you to, you know, discuss a little about maybe or the importance of complicating uh, these discussions on gentrification, development, and change, uh, alluding to some comments you made earlier. So why is it important that it's not that we do not view it as such a black and white, um, you know, clear cut issue? Well, I, I would argue that um, the the sickness of our age is people viewing things as black and white, clear cut issues. Um, But beyond that, I think that it's important, especially I think in communities that have benefited, and I I hate to use that word because, but who have had had positive outcomes in some ways from gentrification. I think it's important for us to talk about that, right? So for example, in the Greek community, and, and I'll speak to that because I know it the best and because it's in large parts, you know, the story of my own family, being sort of driven out of Greek town brought us into the suburbs and and all the things suburban living has historically bestowed upon people, including, you know, schools. The history of suburban school districts is tied very deeply to the history of desegregation and American racism. And the fact is Greek Americans all over the United States, but also in the Chicagoland area, benefited from the creation of suburban school districts as they moved into those suburbs. And different communities are impacted differently by by gentrification. And the Greek community is one in which I think the impact of gentrification overall has been socioeconomically positive. And that is, or economically positive. And that is complicated, I think. And it's worth talking about. 
And I don't mean positive in the sense that like, it's a good thing these things have happened, but I think Greek communities in America are overall wealthier because they were, Greeks were driven out of Greek towns and wealthier and better educated. And Greeks are rightly proud of the fact that um, Greek Americans rank among the most well-educated and the wealthiest Americans. But I think we need to make the connection between that statistic and the ways in which Greeks were able to take advantage of changing urban landscapes. I mean, and the reason the Greeks were able to do that, the reason the Greeks were able to assimilate into, into whiteness that way has everything to do with what I was talking about earlier, right? Like Greeks were on this margin. Greek people look phenotypically white in many ways, but also they were on this margin and they were able to sort of take advantage of all that, that historical memory. They were able to take advantage of their, you know, sort of European, that made their flight from their traditional neighborhoods, um, their, their displacement from their traditional neighborhoods, something that ultimately could be turned to their advantage. And that complicated, right? I think that's really complicated. And I think, you know, one of the things that interests me as a, as a scholar, how Greek identity in America plays out and exposes some of these inconsistencies and irregularities and idiosyncrasies of race in America. And I think that complicates everyone's conversation around these things. Is that rebellious enough for you all? I'm wondering if anyone has anything to add or to respond to those complications that Catherine brought in. We would be on the Zoom another three hours. <laughs> I, one of the things, reasons I bring it up all the time, almost ad nauseum, is that I think in my community, like in many, I think, older immigrant communities, some of the conversations about race can be very reductive. And because we don't acknowledge the privilege that existed in our own experience, we are having a partial conversation about race in America, or a very unhelpful one. And I think it's very important to my community to remind them, yeah, not only were we, you know, did we experience discrimination when we came to this country? When Greeks came to America, they were universally poor. They experienced discrimination. That is, that is true. But I would add, but and, there was also these other factors at play. These other things happened. And I, I bring it up all the time because I want my own community to, to kind of talk more in a more nuanced way about our own history. And that is, not, that is not to take away from what our parents and grandparents accomplished in this country. It is not to take away from their struggle. I have mentioned my Papu George so many times. You guys are probably sick of hearing about him. I would never undervalue how hard he worked. But I also recognize that he drew some very lucky cards as well in terms of systemic oppression in America. Does anyone have anything to add? Well, I... Um, do have a comment. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to compare our experiences because um, many times, uh, according to even the census, the, we could be classified, the Chinese or Asians could be classified as white, depending on what they're looking for, you know, to increase the number. And in terms of um, equality in the workforce, um, you know, you could get promoted up to a certain point, then there's that glass ceiling right there. And so far, I, I think it's still there, you know, with many of the big corporations, you know, so it's that much harder for people of color um, to, to um, get to break that get glass ceiling, even though you're very qualified for these type of uh, jobs. So, yeah, so it, it's, it's sometimes it's not so obvious, you know, or blatant, but it's very subtle and you're, you're not invited into the boys club, you know, to go golfing or doing certain activities and things like that, you know, so, um, I think for for us, you know, who are um, people of color, and we we are still experiencing these negative oppressions. Thank you. 
But I, I just have one good thing to say because Illinois is the first state that passed the TEACH Act. And I'm not sure if everybody knows what that is, but we're very excited about that because that is um, the TEACH Act, the Teaching Equitable Asian American Community History Act. And so it requires the Illinois schools district to teach about Asian American history, because right now our history is not even in the books, you know, that, you know, not having that, uh, it erased our legacy and contribution of the Asian Americans. And so then this act will improve cross-cultural education for all students in Illinois, and hopefully advance racial equity. So we're very excited about that. That is definitely exciting. And that's a great segue to my last question, because I'm keeping an eye on time and we want to get to the live audience discussion. Um, but each of your organizations, institutions are involved with educational efforts. And, you know, Sherry mentioned earlier documentation projects that she has been involved with this, uh, making sure that this, these, these experiences of community members uh, are documented and the historical record includes uh, such diverse voices and, and experiences. So my last question is just to see if you would like to talk a little bit about any efforts on this topic of urban change and safeguarding cultural heritage that your institutions are involved with? I would say that uh, one project that the Brownsville Historical Society was a part of in 2012, I was appointed by Governor Quinn, might've been earlier, <laughs> whenever he was in office, right? <laughs> to be a part of what was called the Amistad Commission. And it just like the Teach Act, was created through the office of the governor of the state of Illinois. Uh, sadly, it has not met in this entire time that we've had Governor Pritzker in office and have made countless appeals to ask that he restore the Amistad Commission because we had made such great advances in uh, putting curriculum about African-American presence in the United States and the contributions that Blacks have made to this nation. And so uh, I certainly would like to speak further with uh, Sulo and others to make certain that curriculums that are developed uh, certainly are part of what's taught in uh, Black communities as well. And so most of us who have been a part of the Amistad Commission still are advocating with schools that we have rich connections with to use the curriculum that was developed. It is available and free online on the DuSable Museum of African American History's website. And the curriculum uh, it could be used, uh, you know, certainly for homeschoolers as well. And it is for youth ages five, all the way through college level. It's uh, really an, an intensive amount of content that was made over many years. I didn't join the Amistad Commission until probably nine years after it was established. So that's one way in which the society has wanted to elevate and give voice to African-American history and culture, not just of Chicago, but globally. I would say the second effort we've made intentionally is to interview people who lived in public housing. So we have on our website stories from 13 individuals, one from pretty much every public housing development that was in Chicago, Ida B. Wells, Madden Park, the Ickes, Cabrini Green. And so that we gave voice to those who wanted to share their experiences of living in public housing and uh, even how they felt about the dismantling. And then we have also uh, YouTube content for migrant stories. So there are a series of stories that were recorded in 2004. So there, it's been a while since those were recorded, but still valuable. Seven individuals who recorded their history of how they arrived in Chicago from the South. And some did it second person or third person and talked about a grandparent's experience of coming here. So we have all these amazing tools out here in which we can have engagement 
not just in classrooms, but in, in homes. I generally use Thanksgiving when that is normally a great time that families are congregating and socializing and children are out of school. So I encourage everyone who is on this Zoom to use those dates that we spend together as family or intentionally make dates online, which I've done with my grandchildren. So we'll watch phenomenal work that's done all over the city on, on history. Then we're able to have conversations. So there's ways in which we can engage not just others, but our own families in these conversations. And I think that's going to be most important, especially because so often we don't talk about race. We don't talk about cultural appropriation. We don't talk about white supremacy. We don't talk about legislation and laws and mandates that regulate it, how especially African-Americans were able to be a part of the fabric of community. So not just the vote, but, you know, housing and education and political will. And so I think that if many of, of those who are on the Zoom will go to the DuSable Museum uh, website, take a look at some of the curricula, and use it as a way to have conversations in your house. Because that's where racism starts, is through folks having ideas about those who are not like them. But why not celebrate and honor the fact that we are diverse and we all come from different backgrounds and have all different stories about how we became a part of the American society. So I'm encouraging everyone to teach someone or share with someone something other than yourself, something more than yourself. I agree with Sherry 110%. You know, she is so right on and it really um, very vo vocal in promoting this. I think that's where it is, the, the connection and uh, having experience of talking about these things. Uh, just like our museum, we also have a history, an oral history project recording uh, some of the stories from the immigrants, as well as um, the Chinese American or Chinese soldiers who served in the World War II and who will be receiving the um, congressional gold medals from government. So this is really an honor to uh, pay respect and honor them for their bravery in serving our country. I feel that's very important. And then also our museum, we have, you know, exhibitions to tell people, educate the general public about Chinese American uh, immigration stories and experiences. And so that's very important. So yesterday we just had a visit from the Illinois Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton, she was so remarkable. She was so enthusiastic and, and she really wanted to learn more about the Chinese American culture and, and, and the experience. And she speaks to us about the racism, how wrong it is and, and really supportive of the TEACH Act. And uh, when I mentioned to her, we're part of the uh, Chicago Cultural Alliance and we collaborate with Ron Phil and Haitian uh, American Museum. She goes, there's an Haitian American Museum? I gotta go and find out where it is. <laughs> and so she is like just really uh, gung-ho on recognizing all how important education is, just as Sherry just mentioned too. So to us, you know, we're educators. I was a public school teacher for over 30 years. And so, so that's really, really important to us. That's how we learn about each other. And the more we learn about each other, the more compassion that we have and respect for each other. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, in, in addition to the exhibitions, we also have public programmings that educate the public about the, uh, the history and culture of the Chinese Americans here uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, we had, uh, you know, our Mid-Autumn Festival celebration not long ago, right? At, uh, you know, Set in Stone Gathering Space, we had uh, a lot of, you know, uh, participants that more than we expected. Believe it or not, you know, most of them are, are non-Chinese, actually. So they 
they, they uh, you know, came to our event to learn about the Chinese culture and to enjoy, you know, the atmosphere, you know, under the, the mid-autumn, you know, moon. And we also have uh, participated in the uh, Chinese New Year parade. And we have Chinese New Year in the event celebrations. All these public, transport, uh, uh, public uh, you know, programming aims to preserve and educate the public about our uh, Chinese culture and, uh, and history. And um, talking about, you know, how heritage or historic preservation could be done, I could think of one good example. Uh, that example is the designation of On Learn Merchants Association building as a Chicago landmark by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks in 1993. The same year, the building was purchased by the um, Chinese Christian Union Church, CCUC, and then it was renamed as the uh, Puitak Center. And believe it or not, the Chinese style building was actually designed by two Norse architects in 1926, as there were no Chinese architects available in Chicago at the time. And later, the Puitak Center won a hundred thousand dollar grant in 2017, uh, 2007 from the partners in preservation program sponsored by American Express and the National Trust for Historic Preservation and to start in some restoration work. The building now hosts various religious committee and educational programs. So as a member of the community, we need to closely monitor the development of our community or neighborhood. So in order to embrace the good, but avoid the bad. Uh, you may call it you know, the uh, gentrification. So in other words, we need to voice our concern and seek or even fight for necessary resources that can help revitalize you know, our community. And besides you know, our, our museum and other organizations that I can think of that uh, you know, work very hard in doing this is the uh, Coalition for a Better Chinese American uh, Community, CBCAC. Uh, it seeks to unite the resources of member organizations and individual members to empower Chinese American communities in Greater Chicago. Solan is sitting on their board. So as a coalition of member organizations and individuals, CBCC carries it, uh, out its missions through civic education, issue advocacy, communication with policymakers, and community mobilization. It called together the Chinatown Development Advisory Committee to ensure the Chinatown community has the right to stay, the culture is preserved, and the voices are included in future developments. So it also seeks to ensure Chinatown's voices are heard through voter registration, as they did in 2010 and 2020 census, as well as redistricting in putting together an Asian world, including Chinatown. Thank you. Catherine, do you have anything brief to say on um, yeah. your work and, and the work of the National Hellenic Museum? Yeah, so um, the National Hellenic Museum's, you know, bread and butter is preserving the Greek story in America. And um, we do that through our oral history project, which is the largest collection of Greek American oral histories anywhere. Um, also, if you people of the audience have photos of old Greek town. Our collections manager, Jeremy Booker, would love you forever. So much of the photographic evidence of old Greek town is, I think, not gone, probably hiding in people's basements somewhere. So we want to be able to recreate, to not recreate, like destroy the University of Illinois campus and rebuild, but recreate digitally the old Greek town to give people a sense of what old Greek town looked like. And um, if you have pictures of that, you don't even have to give us the original. We will get you a high quality digital scan and let you keep your photographs. If you have those, please get in touch with the museum. We would be forever thrilled. Um, and I just want to echo really quickly some of the things that my co-panelists are saying. The best part of my growing up, like the best thing I got out of my Greek heritage was sitting around the dinner table talking. I thought that was the only thing you talked about. In my own life, everything that I know to be true, I learned by listening to stories at family dinner tables. And I think that there is power in those stories we tell around the table. And I think that 
I'm going to echo what, what other people have said. We need to tell those stories and we need to tell other people's stories and we need to keep telling those stories because that is how, that is how and where people learn what is true. That's the power of the Chicago Cultural Alliance. Yay! <laughs> exactly. Yay! And it all comes back. We did a good job. <laughs> and Sherry and I are taking this show on the road. <laughs> oh, well, listen, thank you all. Uh, that's a beautiful note to turn things over to our live audience uh, question, Q&A. But thank you all uh, for so much for coming together. Obviously, this could go on for three more hours, right? I think it's it's time for us to, uh, yeah, extend the discussion with our audience. So once again, thank you. And here we are live. <laughs>